Okay. Anybody still hear me all right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. All right, great. So let's get started. Um, so uh, let's see who's actually here. Hopefully, we'll join later. We got some. All right. And right, no survey yet. Okay. Uh, paste the link again for folks just showing up. It still doesn't let you add it to Google Drive. Embedded no. in the angle. No, no. It's a uh, Google Docs has encountered a server error. If reloading the page doesn't help, please let us know. It said that for months. Okay. So here's uh, here's uh, some of the things that are new. So uh, you all probably got an email uh, last night that was felt maybe too long, but um, Stephen Cook has um, created a, a first shot, first draft tutorial for uh, marking synapses. And uh, I've created a new Google group just specifically for synapses to uh, recruit folks from the community. Um, uh, you can reread the email yourself, but uh, you, you know, just, just to kind of point it out, um, you know, have a look at the YouTube video, see if it makes any sense, log into the CatMate instance, CatMate instance continues to run. Is, is there a question? No. Okay. Uh, so anyways, yeah, CatMate instance continuing to run. Um, we're using up our... Lab, and if you are one. Yep, somebody's listening there. Good. Um, <laughs> no problem. So um, we're using our, uh, our uh, you know, Amazon donated credits to keep that thing up there. So uh, might as well might as well use it. He's gonna. He didn't. He he did a five minute video, and in the next section, he's gonna talk specifically about synapses. But he gets into like how you use CatMate in this first one, and a little bit about how you identify neurons and synapses. So have a look and and provide feedback um, because we could get this going sooner rather than later. Um, obviously, this has been a long a long time coming, but um, but we've made good progress, I think, recently. So uh, check that out. Uh, I'm going to make some progress on that in a few days. OK, also, you may have noticed um, we had office hours <laughs> last week. Um, this is an idea that I got from uh, the Wikidata project. Um, just basically, um, you know, we've had public hangouts before, but I think it's even lower barrier of entry to, um, to do this office hours, where it's via IRC, and you can get there through a single link. Um, you can check out the logs from this last section. Um, it was actually quite cool. We got people who, at least I don't know who they are. Um, there was this Torelli and John Idle guy um, who were seemed to have some answers to things. But other than that, um, I didn't know anybody else uh, who was there. Um, so uh, you know, they were sort of asking some of the basic questions to get started. But uh, it's always good to go back to. Uh, remembering what the project looks like from the outside. So we'll do it again. I, I, I think uh, it makes sense to do it on the off week where we don't have this meeting. Um, and so I've got another one set up for uh, next Wednesday. So feel free to drop by and, and help answer questions. Um, I'll definitely be at all of these so um, so you don't have to, but um, but you're welcome to come. And it's at a time that's chosen to be friendly, you know, Europe, Europe friendly. Um, and uh, it's about the same time. Um, so that, that's cool. OK, uh, EC2 sim engine. So I actually did coding. Uh, I don't always get to. Uh, I'm happy when I get to. Um, so I actually have been um, take, pulling down all, the, um, all of the jars and bundles from GitHub and installing them on this uh, EC2 instance. Um, this address will change as I take up and, and, and you know put down the instance. But basically, it's got front end in there. It's got sample simulation in there. Um, and it has the SPH. Now, um, Giovanni and Matteo have been working with me um, constantly to um, upgrade. And, and there have been a lot of fixes that have had to go in for this uh, EC2 deployment. It's on an Ubuntu 12.04 uh, instance. So um, some things had to be generalized. And, and thanks to those guys for um, being able to continually check and improve. Um, behind this, by the way, uh, actually, I don't think I showed this. Uh, I don't think I showed this before to even Matteo. But behind this, uh, let me go dig it up. Is a let's see. 
not here. Uh, where is it? Here, right. So behind this, I'm using something called IPython Notebook um, to um, to capture the build process. So although it's a little bit, it's quite a bit more annoying uh, to do this than it is to work on a on a uh, shell. Um, what's nice is that I'm actually tracking all the steps that I'm doing in the shell in an interactive on an interactive page where I can save and go back to all the changes that I make. It runs on top of IPython. Um, and, um, and so when I'm running the server, I'm basically doing it and executing it here. And what that means is that um, my next step uh, that's going to be really nice is that I'm going to turn this into a script um, that pulls down all of the uh, code from GitHub, uh, downloads you know, the Virgo server, um, ships it off, uh, actually even launches an EC2 instance um, and sets it up so that uh, then we can both uh, deploy an AMI that has all this stuff on it and we can also provide build scripts um, for folks to do this themselves. So right now the instance that I just showed you is running. Um, there are, we've already identified several um, multi-user uh, issues that just haven't really come up because we've only been you know, debugging on, on, on localhost. I'm sure Mateo can, can say more about that. But um, um, you know something to put on a list, um, not I don't, not necessarily get done sooner rather than later. But anyway, point is now the more that you're the more that you're adding onto this framework, uh, the more it's actually you know visible um, in an easy way. And I'm going to maintain this uh, build script and uh, give ourselves a dev instance so we can easily update uh, and see where the code is and where the code is running. Also to let other people um, install it themselves. There are quite a few um, platform-specific things, like uh, the installation of the OpenCL drivers is kind of hard to make generic across Windows, uh, Mac, and, and, and Ubuntu. But, um, but I'm excited that this code is actually getting out there. Um, the, you know, Matteo and Giovanni and all, and all you guys, you know, Sergey, you guys have all, you know, Andre, I've all been working hard to produce this code, and I... I've just been dying to uh, to make sure that other eyeballs are getting to see it. Steven. Yes. Check the chat. Uh oh, am I out? There's an instant meme. Check the chat of the end out. I don't always do coding, but when I do, I get stuff running on EC2. <laughs> 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 well, you guys are doing you guys are doing all the all the work here on actual, <laughs> you know, build stuff. So I feel like uh, this is the only way I really add some add some value. So no, I, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's good. So I mean, we have we have it. We might as well use it, right? Yeah. All right. Cool. So the last. No, I mean, we we need we need to do that. Otherwise, uh, all the work we do doesn't get seen. Yeah. by people, so it's very important. It's just that we we never do it, <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. like it's highly appreciated that you put time into doing that. My pleasure. The, yeah. It's uh, it's one of our epics, right? So um, so we're we're basically almost there on that one. Okay. Um. So uh, last thing that I have, uh, so and I don't know. If, any of you UK guys are responsible for this, but I got an email two weeks ago after the last sprint from a writer at Wired UK. Uh, they were interested in the Open One project. In fact, they weren't just interested, they had been, this person had been um, pointed to the project by their editor and asked to write a short article. Um, from previous experience with Wired, um, I think that they like uh, nice pictures, um, and especially nice pictures that you know have like Creative Commons type licenses that they can republish. So um, the writer I talked to uh, said that it was probably just going to be a short thing. You know, it was, you know, uh, he said 400 words, which is practically nothing, but probably just like an image and a little pointer to the project. Um, but that's always exciting. Um, it is Wired UK, which is different than Wired US and Wired Italy. They all have separate um, publishing centers, so what goes into one issue does not necessarily go into any of the other countries. Um, I, uh, I emphasize the team effort. I um, 
wanted to ensure that uh, that they make it very clear this is a community effort and uh, and it's not about me. Um, so um, so I don't know when that's going to come out. I didn't get any heads up on on when or if it's finally going to be published. Although, given that the editor had asked, um, it seemed positive. So um, so it's exciting. So I don't know. Hit Wired UK often and see if Open Worm pops up. Did, did any of you other UK guys? Did you know about this in advance? Uh, or did anybody drop you a note? Or? Uh, no, no. Just yeah. that uh, Scientific American a while back, but yeah, right. Uh, sorry, did you say it was going to be print or online? Uh, I think he said it was going to be all of the above um, okay. by the time it was done. Yeah, I think they kind of when, for the within the region. I think they reuse content, but just doesn't go outside. Do yeah. we know what issue? No, no, didn't say. Didn't say. Just said, you know, soon. Did he ask for any specific images, or should we try generating some new ones? Didn't ask for any new ones. No, he he did said that uh, you know the images that he basically seeing on the website on the website were sufficient. So um, I'm sure we could generate some new stuff with the WebGL version. Yeah, there was a lot of good new stuff, absolutely. But um, at this point, I think they, he was even just happy with the old stuff. So, um, so we'll see. But uh, you know, we could get a, a bounce pretty soon. Um, part of the reason why I want to make sure that our code is actually, you know, out there, uh, easy to easy to get to, because you know, I I, yeah. I want to be sure that we're not, uh, you know, fearing to hype the project, right? But I mean, obviously, we know that the code is there. It's just that somebody from the outside. Doesn't always know. So um, anyway, um, I think you should all be really excited about this. I'm really excited about this. Um, it's always a good sign, uh, you know. But at the same time, the the only downside, which I'm sure you know, Borg will remind us of, and I and I and I have your voice in the back of my mind, is that you know, um, obviously making sure that uh, you know serious scientists um, don't view this as kind of just a pop science thing um, is always important. Um, it never hurts to have the pop science folks, I think, but but um, we have to maintain a balance between that. And yeah. So, um, so obviously, when that comes out, we'll uh, point everybody to it and uh, you know, reblog it and all that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. we'll buy uh, local copies in the news agent. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Again, it, yeah, it's probably going to be short, so um, you know, not not a deep thing. But but he asked good questions. You know, I pointed him at cyber elegance as a background and. Um, you know, he's curious about how we all came together, right? Just like online and just all that good stuff. So, just the. Okay. Um, and by the way, I, I don't have a specific point on this, but uh, but Tim and I have been addressing this issue of collecting all the data together uh, in a single place, and uh, we've even been looking at some visualizations that will give us like a heat map for doing that. Um, Tim, do you want to say anything about that right now? I was just kind of wanting to make sure that that got on the agenda. Uh, no, I'm just other than yeah, we've been working on it, and I update the uh, Excel spreadsheet out there on the Dropbox uh, kind of every couple of weeks. Just, just basically, to me, it's just working notes at this point. Um, but yeah, we're. Uh, I'm going to look at some of the suggestions you gave to us last night, and uh, you know, see what we can put together. Yeah, several of you have been asking for this, and I, and I think it's very important. And I just don't want anybody to think that I've I've forgotten about it. It's um, to figure out the exact strategy. On how to do it has been a little tricky, but I think that um, compiling what we have, visualizing what we have as a starting point with the 302 neurons is a, is a good place, and then we can we can scale out from from there. Um, another good thing for folks to be able to see when they when they come in. Okay, so let me turn it over to folks. I know that there have been. Sorry, um, just quickly, um, I, I I know that there's a lot of stuff in the Dropbox, but uh, there's uh, data on connections um, is still under the GitHub. Uh, C. Elegans NeuroML repository, so I think we kind of agreed in the past to have that as, at least for the connections, the kind of central source for what's there, as opposed to having it on multiple locations. Just double checking on that. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, for, I, I, again, I, these are just like, uh, you know, working notes that I'm putting okay. out there. It's not, yeah. it's not anything serious as, at this time. Just Okay. Okay. You can give people visibility of what I'm working on and what I'm pulling together, but nothing. Uh, yeah, definitely. The, 
definitely the more things we can get to integrate into NeuroML, the better it is. Like any sort of information, like whether it's the ID that goes back to, I don't know, Neuralex, whatever. Yeah. It, it's good to have it all there, especially since we're building tools to visualize that, that would give us the possibility to have all of this information into context as opposed to having yeah. fragmented over different files and documents. Yeah, and uh, again, any bits, even just uh, brief notes on each of the cells, uh, types of cells and so on, all that, if, if all that information goes in one spreadsheet, it's very easy to pull that out and to get it into valid NeuroML. And if somebody takes away the NeuroML, has all that information with them, then whatever type of visualization, whatever type of transformations they do on that, it will be included with it. But for our purposes, if it goes in that chat spreadsheet, it can be incorporated into everything with NeuroML and visualization and so on. Agreed. Okay. So this is what uh, the folks at Neuromorpho have asked for um, on every cell. And um, we found uh, the source for it on, on Worm Atlas. And Tim is working to just extract that directly so that we have that then in spreadsheets. And then that would be updated in GitHub. And then that could be updated in NeuroML. So this is exactly what we're, what we're targeting. Um, so it's, okay. it's, it's got a good motivation because they, they want to make sure this, all this metadata is there before uh, NeuroMorpho will accept it. So yeah. Yep. Great. OK. So um, I think there have been some open worm presentations uh, in the UK in uh, the last uh, in the last week. So uh, I'll hand it over to other folks. Uh, we kind of went to see the monkeys instead. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't present yeah, like, We tweeted it, dude. <laughs> the there was no totally lose faith in us. So it was like lunch time. So you had either to get lunch to. <laughs> put up the poster or to go to the zoo. And there were two other posters <laughs> in a meeting for about 40 people. So there was only two posters up. And so you had a free entry to the zoo if you wanted during your lunch hour. So we decided to go to the zoo instead. Well, mostly because nobody who went to the poster, everybody was more interested in looking at gorillas. So we didn't even put the poster up. <laughs> it was slightly off topic. Uh, uh, meeting. It was more about uh, crowd sensing, crowdsourcing, um, citizen science, and so on. Uh, so it would have been probably interesting for them, but um, not directly relevant for most of the people there. But it, it, it is more relevant probably to what you're trying to do now with uh, Stephen Cook in terms of yeah. cat made a crowdsourcing, positioning of synapses. That is exactly the kind of things that were there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, with that, yeah, the poster didn't really speak to that, but, um, okay, well, it uh, looks like, I, I, did, did Cambridge uh, pick up London's slack in the Open Worm presentation this week, then? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I gave a presentation to about 20, 20 people. Uh, it's a couple of, um, couple of groups in Cambridge. One of them is the Brain Mapping Unit, and the other is the Cambridge Connectome Consortium. Very grand names, but they're they're, um, <laughs> they're basically both guys who look at uh, fMRI data mainly. So oh, it wasn't it wasn't really uh, in their field, but it it generated quite a lot of interest. Got uh, all sorts of the usual questions, sort of oh, what you know, you should be targeting this level of complexity or is higher level of complexity and. Um, is this really feasible? But it did. It gen generated lots and lots of interest. Um, there was also one guy there called Jeff, who told me he uh, he came to the office hours IRC meeting. Oh, so, yeah. There was a Jeff. There, there was, was a Jeff. Jeff one. So, his name was his name. His real name was Jeff. I don't know what his IRC. Yeah, name his was. nickname was also Jeff. Okay, <laughs> so that was him. Yeah. Um, so it was it was pretty interesting because it was uh, to a bunch of people, n n none of whom were uh, either you know looking at worms or or relatively small networks. But it was it was a it was a pretty good presentation. I I kind of you did it by combi mainly combining a lot of presentations. Um, I talked quite a bit about NeuroML, so I gave a pitch for NeuroML. So uh, keep an eye out on the website, see if you get a bunch of hits, Podrick coming from Cambridge. Anyway, yeah, it was it was a uh, it was I thought it was quite a good presentation. Cool. And also uh, this guy from the Open Flybrain project. You guys heard of this? 
Um, oh, was it, uh, can you get a Sunni Sutherland? Y- yes, yeah. He uh, he came up and he said, uh, "Go over, you know." Looks like you guys are developing technology which we might use, and I said, "Yeah, well, you probably." I I basically said, "You probably are better off talking to Matteo, Stephen, or Giovanni." So I also invited him to a hangout. He can't come to this one. He said he might come to the next one. We'll see. I don't. Do you guys know anything about this? I don't really know much about it. So can you put a link or his name? Sure. Yeah, you, or you have it, haven't you met uh, David? He's been to INCF meetings before. Uh, I thought he, I thought you mentioned. What was so? What was his name? David his name was David Southern. David something Sutherland. It's, he has a quite a strange name. Um, it's. Really, hang on. I'll tell you in a second. Um, David Osumi Sutherland. I don't know if I know him. Um, oh yeah, he's a guy who's on this guy. Google Plus. This guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I, it was it was one of those conversations where I wasn't quite it wasn't quite clear what exactly he wanted, but uh, he said, "Oh, we're develop- we've got this project, and it looks like you guys might be uh, um, developing some technology which we might be able to use or contribute to." Um, but yeah. I, I, I decided that it would be better to point him in your direction rather than... Yeah, definitely. So. I guess yeah. that's one for, for Stephen. Um, a few different virtual fly brain projects out there of mm. different types. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, that, that guy has been interacting on Google Plus and resharing stuff. And I don't... Um, is he the guy who compiled that list of... Um, Opens like not open, but like brain related stuff. Artificial brain. Yeah, is it, no, is it no, the no. same guy? No, that's a cream or someone. No, that's. Uh, I really. D- yeah, P P E A R N. Right. Anyway, I expect him. Expect him to possibly be in touch with one of you guys. So just just so first of all, I pasted the link in there of some work that they're doing in WebGL. Um, we've spoken with him hmm. before. He's a fan of the Worm browser. He's asked yes. how to do a similar thing for, um, you know, That's true. I basically pointed him at the at the source code and said, "Go for it." Um, Pick it in New Yeah, it'll be all there and WebGL in no time. Yep, yep. Well, that's what I sh- that's what I said to him, Padraig. That's another piece too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are as I say, there are a few different uh, virtual fibrain projects out there. Um, at least one of them has reconstructed neurons, which. Um, uh, are in SWC format, at least some of them. So could quite easily be converted to NeuroML and would be usable straight away in um, uh, the WebGL visualizer that we have here. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of good stuff coming, and you know, I, 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 I tend to think that with these sorts of collaborations, you know, the shared code libraries is the way to the best way to do it. Um, where yeah. can do, so. Um, so yeah. So he's. Um, He's a friend and I think a fellow traveler along the along the path. Um, okay, good. Um, so glad that went well. All right, um, maybe we can uh, you know go into some of the other uh, topics then, or just kind of going around the room. Um, Alex, uh, I didn't. I don't think I got even. I don't think I got to you last time um, before you had to go. So let me start with you, uh, since we uh, haven't seen you in a little bit. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, basically, I don't have much to say. Uh, I just realized that I uh, need to uh, get a stronger neuroscience background, so I started to read a book which Mike commented me to. Oh, which one? Uh, Computational Neuroscience by Abbott and some other guy. It's really Good nice. By the way, um, on that, in the Dropbox, uh, there is a folder directly under the C. Elegans, um, directly under the root, called Neuroscience Books. that has a bunch of PDFs in it, which I promise I have the copyrights for. Great. <laughs> so anyway, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff there. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, besides that, I just... Uh, 
you, basically, if you have any like thing in mind what they can do without like, deep knowledge of neuroscience, I'm really happy to do it. But with the uh, model, basically, I realized that I cannot say whether it's working right or not. That, that was my problem. Um, I have I have some ideas, Alex. We could talk about it later. Okay, great. Recently, I've been a bit occupied with other things, but yeah, I've definitely got lots of ideas, things we can do together. Okay, sure. So, oh yeah, uh, let's arrange the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think I'd actually also like to like to join and uh, and anyone else just on this just to get back to the subject of model optimization. Um, you guys did uh, awesome work getting the muscle cell out there, and I've I've now pointed to it, uh, you know, online, and it's like ready to go. Uh, and now we were like, okay, so now we need to pick it up with the uh, actual running of the of the optimization process. Um, so let's see if we can't figure out how to kind of incorporate that. Um, yep. Later this, uh, well, in, in, during this next two weeks. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, Alex. So yeah, any anything? Any, there's plenty of books there. Also, if there's any other, um, you can also remember use the Mendeley group. Oh, loud. Um, that's you, Mike. Um, you can also use Mendeley for and there. All the paper is in the Open Worm. Um, Directory there are, can also be helpful for probably not the basic introductions to the neuroscience, but uh, uh, you know at least getting a sense of some of the more of the biology side. Um, and we'll okay, I'll check it out. And then Tim, do you have any favorite resources on neuroscience that you've come across that have been useful to you as you've been on your journey? Well, yeah, I mean, there's tons of websites. Obviously, I, I find all those. Plus, I you know I use all the journals. That Pulled together. Um, yeah, yeah, there's lots of information out there. Is what I would say. So that that group of books usually represents, you know, the, the library of, you know, to get to get yourself started. And um, I tend to curate that so that it's um, as useful as possible. Okay. Um, so we'll get a we'll get a model optimization meeting set up. Um, Um, all right, let's go on to Matteo. Um, you actually have, have you shown all the awesome stuff? I don't think you've shown all the awesome stuff to the, to the group that uh, you've been developing recently. No, it was after the, it was after the last meeting we uh, had. So there are a couple of progress. Uh, we made. I will first start uh, not with SPH though, just because I have two separate servers, and uh, at the moment the visualizer one is already started. So, I just give me a second. Has I just lost it? Where is it? Okay. I share the screen. Okay, so tell me when you go, are able to see the warp. Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. So I've been just working more on the um, on the visualizer, and so this is not the right? Sorry. This is different from the Worm browser, right? So that everybody knows. Yeah, this is different from the Worm browser. This is the native NeuroML visualizer that uh, I'm working on. This is loading the connectome as we have it at the moment. OK. So uh, well, it is possible to do, uh, as I was showing last time, things that are not possible to do with the Worm browser. And mainly, it is possible to uh, it is possible to select. Uh, I just did something that I wasn't supposed to do, which is resize the window. I still haven't wrote the code to take care of when you resize the window, so I'm just refreshing. Sorry. Okay. Demo. Demo law. law so, uh, okay. 
one thing that uh, I have. How do you food. how do you go to that perspective when everything is? I'm just I'm about. just pressing uh, Z on my keyboard. That just a random key I decided to map, but then I will put more thought and I will add a legend that says what kind of functions are available. But since last time, what I added is the possibility to actually show what is connected to what. So say, and also the neuron is visualized. There are different colors for the dendrites, for the axon, and the soma. So you see, the, basically, when I click on a neuron, it changes. Basically, I'm selecting that. And in white, we can see the neurons that are connected to that one. So this is definitely not possible with a warm browser. And obviously, as still as I click on them, here we can see the updated properties. Obviously, since our model is not a good model, <laughs> Every neuron has exactly the same properties. The only thing that changes is the ID. But it is basically interesting. There's another key that basically hides everything which is not selected or connected. Mm. So this is to basically to, have a, to not have too much stuff ongoing. So you can switch between these two different modes. But it is, it is definitely interesting because like even at this level, you start clicking, and you don't know how much clicking I've done in the past few weeks. It's just like you get carried away, and you start thinking, oh, but if this is connected to that, <laughs> and you just keep doing it, jumping from cell to cell, which is quite uh, interesting. It's beautiful. It's really cool, and I don't think it's done, it's done anywhere else in, in computational neuroscience to actually be able to explore a neural circuit this way, with the morphologies in place, to see the nearest neighbors. Um, so that, does it mean that uh, that particular neuron is only connected to those other uh, four or five yeah. neurons? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, in theory, you could get, you could re re replicate that circuit independently for everything else. What do you mean replicate? Uh, what do you mean replicate? Like, if you knew the parameters for those neurons. You could have a model for that particular sub circuit, and no, no? because those others, those are, what, neuron A is connected to neurons B, C, and D, but B, C, and D are connected oh, sure. to E, F, G, H, yeah. J, and oh, they yeah. feed back. Yeah, but you could deconstruct it more easily than with the different. Uh, what I'm saying is that you could do them one well, by you, one. You can identify, for instance, neurons that are a sort of circuitry in isolation, and like take this one. This one doesn't seem to be connected to anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> but does it get inputs from others? Obviously, I guess. Uh, I yeah. Then to... you, should, you should show also the uh, neurons that are not only the ones that are connected to the dendrites, but also the ones that go in. Yeah, I think it was that was the idea. We thought that it was doing that. I, I thought that it was doing that already, and we were just discussing this with Park before the meeting started. Ah, okay. It is definitely the idea that you will see both post and pre. But they should probably be in different colors, I would say. Yeah. 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 That's just this is very cool. comment. The visual mode that you had before with the black background and the it kind of looked more like an X ray mode. I I think for this for the synapse uh, investigation it looked, uh, I think it looked a little bit better. There was more contrast with, with the, the black background. Yeah, yeah I like that. When you, more a... when you have all the rest of the, the neurons there, mm. there was more contrast. Like this? And you, you're, are you saying that uh, you thought it was better with uh, black instead of dark blue? Yeah, it's... and then maybe something else that you're doing with the uh, shading or something. Um, just visually, it looks like things that are grayed out are still kind of like covering it up and overlapping it. Uh, well, basically, w what you're seeing is that everything, like in this mode, uh, the neurons that are not selected uh, are transparent. Yeah. So you can see through them. That is why I kind of added this mode. But I think it's also useful to, because otherwise, like if you either you don't see them at all, which it means you are like this, or you see them without uh, uh, being transparent. In which case, you cannot really. Uh, basically, the neuron that is selected could be covered. 
Maybe they could be more transparent. I don't know. But anyway, can I I'll, can I suggest that w we play around with the demo a bit before we make suggestions? Oh, oh yeah. Because cool. I, I think I think it's really or just seeing it like or, or like this way over uh, with the screen share is a bit might be a bit hard to really appreciate yeah, what it's really like to use it. Yeah, and uh, we're getting uh, we're making more progress uh, in terms of deployment and like obviously this will be linked uh, to open source brain and um, so that basically it will be possible from the website to to look at whatever model is checked in an open source brain which is represented in Neuromap. By the way, this is, you know, I, I'm sure Porig this has been your strategy for a while, but it's it's really brilliant to have all these value add tools on top of NeuroML because it's these sorts of tools that are going to bring even more people into NeuroML beyond just like the general notion that standards are good. Like being able to have this level of uh, analysis, you know, for free built into the site. Wow, it's gonna yeah. gonna be huge. So, bravo. Yeah, I mean, and, and, not, and nothing here is um, CLN specific. I mean, everything you see there is uh, can be done for a cortical column or cerebellum or whatever else, or even just an abstract network, visual, kind of layered, layered network. So, I mean, it might crack, fall down at uh, very detailed neurons, but um, here it's perfectly fine. And now you're looking at the most useless mode of all, which is random rotation around your axis. <laughs> your screensaver. <laughs> yeah, it's nice screensaver. Yeah, exactly. Good but it's good when you go to a conference. You don't want, you want it to move. <laughs> so okay. you also want to relay there's more news too right so Sergey's news unfortunately yeah uh, let me just stop one server and start the other one we basically uh, with uh, Joe we finally managed to get the uh, SPH uh, algorithm working on the simulation engine. Not the latest that uh, Andrew and Sergey have shown us, uh, where we pull elastic matter and all of it, but rather the last snapshot of the algorithm that was ported to the simulation engine some months ago, and now Joe will be updating that with the latest. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, it is very, uh, yeah. Okay, it's still starting, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I've been playing with this. And, and by the way, this is the stuff that we were trying to deploy with Steven. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Joe, please do some talk to them fixing something in production. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that page works on At least you can go to that page on the... Uh, you can go to the page on, on the current dev, but it doesn't really do anything right now because there's a... There's a yeah, well, um, on the current dev, probably the, the nice thing to show is this, the, the one that runs with the fake um, web sockets. So it, it, this is not going to the to the server. This is all fake um, like random particles. But uh, basically, what Matteo is gonna show now is um, the full stack. So we got it to work uh, after it took best part of two weeks since the last time, and we had already started. So it probably took more like three weeks um, between me and him. Uh, to get it to work, where he uh, mostly um, worked on the front end. I did most of the work on the back end, as in preparing a simulation bundle. Uh, I was working, I told you last time, that I was working on this generic simulation bundle. Then we, we can say a bit more about that. Uh, and then basically a lot of work was on the solver itself. Because uh, the original version, we had, we had to, t to change it quite a bit. The, uh, not a lot, but like 
refactor some some stuff because there were we found some R coded values in the OpenCL kernels. So it took time to figure out what's what was wrong. The first time that we tried to run it, it was basically di uh, throwing out out of boundary errors and memory access, and it was because there was some some issue in the low-level code. And so uh, the problem was not fixing that. The problem was uh, understanding what was wrong. So, but in the end, now we're basically going from the browser to the to the solver um, and back using this generic simulation bundle and uh, everything is configured via configuration file so there's a project file for the simulation that defines okay I'm gonna use DSPH but in future you could say okay I'm gonna use DSPH and then you run MLM and then there's another integration bundle that figures out uh, how to keep things in sync uh, if Matteo can give me the links to the configuration files, I, c I can show you those. It's interesting to look but at those. Daring Dropbox, everybody can look at them, really. Yeah, I, the URL, I'm looking for the URL. Uh, it's easier just if I if we paste it in the chat. So there's two configuration files for this thing that we're going to show now. And one is the simulation configuration, the other one is the SPH particles. Um, so that's one. Can you paste it in the in the chat? Yeah, I cannot find any more there. The hangout? <laughs> okay, where are you? <laughs> yeah, so that's one. If you click on that, that, that tells you how the simulation is configured. And basically, you can see that there's uh, there's an aspect, and at the moment there's only this SPH aspect, and then um, and there's a model interpreter with, and and a simulator, and those two are bundles that we are deploying, and uh, those values, SPH model interpreter and SPH simulators are identifiers that we use to discover the services dynamically on the server. So basically, all all we need is an interface and that ID. And if uh, a bundle is deployed with those uh, characteristics or properties, then it brings it up. Otherwise, it won't work. Uh, and then you can see that it links to another file that you can follow the link for that. And those are the SPH particles as we define them with Sergey and Andre. Um, so basically, the first file, the one, the one that Matteo put in the chat, um, is supposed to be the the project file, uh, the the configuration file that, that tells the generic simulation bundle w what needs to be simulated. In this case, it's just an SPH aspect, and the model is defined in that other file that it's linked from this file. Um, so this, for example, if we add both, and that's the plan for the for the next step. Once we are happy with this, the plan for the next step is to have another aspect for the electrophysiology, so that we have both physics and electrophysiology um, to do, and, and then there's going to be another integration bundle to do the, to keep them in sync. So basically, basically uh, if you can just reiterate, uh, the idea is that whatever simulation will be happening, it can happen because it's described in the code itself, which is usually what happens in 90 5% of this sort of simulation code in Academy, as in you just have your code that describes the model and then that same code runs your model and you look at it. No, whatever is being run in the simulation engine does not come from the simulation engine itself, it comes from that file. That file describes what needs to be simulated. At the moment, uh, describes an SPH simulation. As soon as that will also work, it will also describe an electrophysiological simulation. Uh, it as we change that file, we basically change the project that is loaded in the simulation engine and the kind of simulation that will happen. So that uh, this, we did it this way so that uh, whenever we have new things to simulate, we just have to change the file and not uh, do another project with a new simulation, if you know what I mean. Uh, so we're going to have a collection of this, of this um, config files. One 
per each simulation we may want to run. Um, obviously, that comes with you won't be able to run a given simulation if you don't have a bundle that a solver or simulator or whatever. So you still have to obviously develop those. So if you want to run, like, implement another physics algorithm, obviously you have to write a bundle that solves the physics the way that you want them to be solved. Uh, but then when it comes to actually running it, you edit this file instead of uh, are coding a bunch of stuff. Uh, so it's it's a bit of, a bit of a start of a multi-purpose engine the way that we always wanted it to be, and hopefully it makes it easier also for other people to use it because people don't have to go and uh, write stuff. They 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 can just swap things in and out from the file. That's a long-term view. Uh, at the moment, it's limited, obviously. And uh, and the idea is also that other people that come along and say want to contribute with one specific solver, they can just write a plugin for the simulation engine that takes care, that fulfills the interfaces that are defined that are required for to communicate with the rest of the simulation engine. But basically, they can just add one module that will take care of a given simulation. Did the Obviously. server come up? Um, so uh, it, it's starting now. Right? Okay. But what did, uh, what did you break? No, no, it's not uh, in the way we were working on the Amazon instance and was fixing the plan, Stephen. Okay. And uh, I forgot that I had to back things the way they were. And, uh, so I mean, once you can show this, uh, it's gonna be obvious what we're talking about. But in the meanwhile, I can tell you. Uh, pretty much, I told you already. Well, uh, if you look at the um, That's my uh, agenda meeting, uh, of the um, agenda of the meeting, there's a list of things, items that I've done. And basically, the result is this thing that Matteo is going to show. So okay. that stuff has been done. This stuff, the to-dos are the next thing to do that I have on my list for this. So we need a oh, reset. This is a reset. So one thing that we need to add to this is a way to reset the simulation, because at the moment, we, oh, we are basically killing the server and restarting it, which is uh, not, not great. <laughs> uh, but it worked just to get it to, to run. And then with, the, with this thing about multi-client connections, so the way that this thing works is that, in theory, uh, if uh, multiple uh, connections, so if we deploy it to EC2, which is the stuff that Steven is trying to do uh, and, and succeeded in doing, uh, if, if all of us go to that address, we basically should see the same stuff going on. So the simulation, the simulation gets streamed to all of them. But the first one who starts it, will be in charge, and if that one leaves, the second <coughs> one becomes in charge, so you can stop it and reset it and do stuff. So that kind of mechanism uh, is not handled. So th that to do, that's what it is. And then the third one, which is actually probably the most uh, important on the list, even if it's the third, is uh, I'm going to basically, Sergey, we had a meeting on Monday. And he's going to help us with a list of changes <coughs> on the UPH. So from the snapshot that we have at the moment to the version that Andre is working on at the moment, there were a number of bug fixes and number of in, in, uh, enhancements, enhancements for the Elastic Matter stuff. And so we need a list of what changed so that we can r basically port those changes into this <coughs> ver version, Java version of the SPH simulator. So that's basically the plan, the next steps for this. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. At, when, when do you imagine that the sort of SPH, the C version of the SPH will just be stopped and everything will start working on the Java? Uh, well, I don't, I'm it. not, yeah, this is, we talked about this before and Stephen is laughing because of that. <laughs> so basically, I don't have strong feelings with regards to that, I don't necessarily want anything to stop. If if that something is a tool for Andre to make progress, so whenever he feels that, uh, so basically my view on this is that we need to embrace diversity and not try try to kill it. Just because diversity is a productivity boost, as in 
you're more comfortable working in that environment, why should I force you to do something else? Uh, so the way that we're looking at it is that that version is uh, a tool for people or whoever is using it or if Mike, if you're working in Python, that, that is a tool for you to be able to do progress and figure out the science and then once you're happy with that, all the knowledge that you extrapolated from that, we bring it into this engine. So it doesn't necessarily need to stop or end the way that I see it. It's just two versions of the same thing. In the first one, it was like the best way that you could like do work the way that you like it. And then we take what you created, what you find out, what you figured out, the science uh, discoveries and, and, and novel algorithms, and we put them into this environment that is supposed to be general purpose. And um, if someone from the outside comes along, it's supposed to be easier for them to like set this up rather than run 100 different things, one in C++ and one in... Uh, Python. So that, that is my personal view, and I don't know that everyone shares it, but... I, I have a slightly different view. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> which is not, not in terms, like, uh, I, I see Joe's point, uh, but my dream is to have something that works so well and that can be much more portable and that uh, even Andre and Sergey can work better on so that they don't feel any more than they need to work on the C version. And, and, and I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying if, if we are able to do something so that works so well that other people want to jump on it, then everyone is happy. But we're not going to like force people or ask someone to stop doing what they're doing or anything like that. Did that answer your question, Mike? Yes. And uh, maybe so, are you up, Matteo? Uh, what? It's something that I don't understand is happening, and the answer is no. So <laughs> the pressure and you, knowing you, that I'm on air and I cannot smash my machine. <laughs> I can I can bring it up, but um, it's gonna have a um, low FPS rate just because my machine and then when when you stream it uh, through the hangout uh, it goes down as well but uh, you're gonna be able to see something so I'm bringing it up myself but it's safe to probably to move on you can blame it on me for having all these issues here at the last minute that caused uh, your environment well no I, I well I should have uh, tried it before the hangout but we were really working till the last minute <laughs> That's exciting. But so, um, I did say go ahead with other things, and in the meanwhile, Joe will bring his up. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to bring my uh, uh, mine up. Hey, if it, let's move on. It so, I mean, I I want, just wanted to jump off off of from what Mike was saying there, um, because um, you know Sergey also got the Linux version right of SPH to work, um, and um, I think I was hoping maybe we could coordinate our next steps on that. Um, but I'm also happy for Mike to take the lead coordinating the next steps on that, whatever you want. Um, but Mike, you also recognize you know, what, what these guys are saying about what they're building into the main engine. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's you know, your judgment as to how you want to proceed. Uh, well, I, I agree with both you know, Giovanni and Matteo. Um, yeah, uh, diversity is good. If we can, if, if Giovanni and Matteo and Sergei make make something which is so good that people will naturally feel the need to only use the simulation engine, then ov obviously that would be an ideal uh, ideal scenario. Um, from my end, so what I've just just managed to do after a huge amount of pain, um, I think mainly because of my hardware is I managed to get the the uh, SPH solver ported to Linux working on my machine. Oh, nice. It oh, was, that's, uh, oh, that's what you got, right. I got yeah. SPH working for the simulation. So that was... No, 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 no. I got it working. I got the, what Sergey, the version that Sergey ported to Linux. I've now got it working on my machine. Um, I was uh, up pretty much all night trying to get it to work, and five minutes before the Hangout, it suddenly ma magically started working. Nice. After awesome. I, after I gave up, I, it was absolutely bizarre. Actually, after I get, I, I ba basically gave up getting it to work on my, on my CPU. So then I decided, right, well, I'll try my, I'll try 
get it to work on my graphics card. So I installed the NVIDIA OpenCL rather than the Intel, which is what my CPU would need. And bizarrely, and I still don't understand how this is happening, the NVIDIA OpenCL driver has got is, is now working, so it's got the SPH to solver to work, but on the CPU, not on the GPU. And the Intel one didn't work. It's, 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 it's extremely I think I th the, the CPU thing doesn't surprise me, because yeah. I was talking to Sergey, and he said that a lot of the stuff they're doing, they're doing it on the CPU, because okay. uh, somewhere along the way, something stopped working on the GPU. So to test the new stuff, they're using the CPUs. I don't get it. I mean, it's a shame. I've got a 16-core GPU, but never mind. Uh, I, I, what I, yeah, I, it's the same for me. I've, I've been having troubles with the GPUs lately, and uh, the way that we're doing it, I mean, the reason why we're using that technology is so that we can do both, yeah. and when it when it's sorted out. Yeah. What, I, what really surprised me, though, was that the I I Intel OpenCL SDK didn't work with my Intel chipset. So then I said, fine, I'll, I'll go to the graphics card and use the NVIDIA SDK so that will work on the graphics card. That didn't work, but the NVIDIA one worked on my Intel chipset. It's completely, it doesn't make any sense, but whatever, it's, it's working. Um, so now what I'm planning to do, um, oh, what, I'm, what I'm going to focus on now is running my the muscle cell model, the electrophysiological model, and at every time step, for instance, passing the value of the memory potential to the SPH solver. The SPH solver won't do anything with it, but just figure out a way to make the SPH solver aware of the electrophysiolo electrophysiological simulation. Uh, Mike, could you <clears throat> did you have to make any changes for the um, uh, did you have to make a make file or anything like that for uh, the Linux version? No, it was it it's it's really well done. Nothing. Okay. It is just G++ with those libraries that... Um... Yeah, I, I, I use the... Yeah, I, I, I compiled using uh, Eclipse, but yeah, that's how you do it. G, G, G++, um, there's four libraries. Yeah. It's just I mean, the, you, open, you... the OpenCL library, <clears throat> all I can say is make sure, try a few different ones if you have trouble, because I okay. found If that you can I, annotate I, any of the readme's or anything, that would be great. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was going to do that. Uh, I don't know if I have right access to that repository, do I? Or maybe I do. Um, I, have a... I think you do as part of the Open Worm organization. Otherwise, okay. um, you, could, you could give it as a pull request. Otherwise, it's a pull request. I'll give it. I'll, I'll uh, yeah. I'll, um, I'll do that. So, oh, yeah, so it's working. And now what I want to do is get, it, get Python to control the SPH simulation. And also control an electrophysiological simulation and pass pass data from one to the other, and then and Andre in future will hopefully be able to use those use those numbers which the electro which the Hashkin Huxley simulation is passing to to work on the contraction of the cell. I've actually got some other things to think about because it's really what uh, what the electrophysiological simulation needs to pass to the to the SPH solver isn't the membrane potential, it's it's a sort of contraction number or whatever you may think about it, because it's not a simple, simple linear relationship. But I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll think about that some more. Yeah. Um, also, okay. also um, Matteo has been recently um, using GitHub issues uh, to track uh, things that, um, you know, a given code repository might not uh, might not have, so I would encourage you as well if you had troubles on certain platforms getting things to work on the GPU or whatnot, that you uh, file an issue um, on that repo. I just pasted the link to the one first for SPH. Um, okay. That would also be helpful. But that's really great that you got it working. Um, yeah, I'm sorry it was so painful. <laughs> Andre, uh, um, Sergey was giving me tech support at 2 a.m. Nice. Siberia time. We've been doing late night tech supports here on <laughs> both these things, uh, so it's very cool. Um, yeah, so Matteo is uh, streaming that thing, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So you want to say something about that, Matteo, now? Uh, well, the, I'm going to get it to work. See, as soon as the pressure was off. <laughs> yeah. So, what you see there, it is basically a Japanese uh, SPH simulation. Uh, 
that is streamed through WebSockets. It's using the latest version of the sport and uh, it's like uh, in terms of uh, performance, we haven't really done anything with it yet, and it, it, it is like now I do have the Hangout, so that is to uh, on my good webcam and everything. Usually, I do have it uh, at 60 frames per second on my machine, which is quite powerful, though. So I don't expect that to be the case for everyone. But at the same time, the uh, important thing is that, uh, like. This will be running on a server. It won't be running on your own machine. So how performant your own machine is won't matter that much. Um, so and this is is there a question? Do you should do yeah exactly. That's the, as soon as we'll uh, fix the problems on C two, everybody will be able to look at this on their own uh, machine. But I, I don't know if you remember the um, SPH uh, demo from Andre and Sergey. When it was at this stage, with weird things happening. <laughs> there was a moment in time when it was like this, and this is the moment in time we have here. Now Joe will uh, update it with the latest, so hopefully we'll, uh, everything going well, we'll be looking at the warm shape uh, uh, body smashing in the sort of Brown, uh, it's of funny brown. that in this version there is uh, weird stuff going on. There seems to be some kind of uh, fountain in the Yeah, left. it's good because it keeps moving uh, yeah. at least. It can <laughs> run it forever. And I think I was very close to, <laughs> to that. Because once you start looking at it, it it's nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's, it's kind of inspiring. Another nice screensaver. That's very cool. So, yeah, just to clarify, maybe you just want to say so. This is your browser uh, connecting via a WebSocket, which is a continual streaming channel, to Amazon's EC, uh, well, to, to, a, to a back end server. In your case, you're running everything locally. But since Mike is asking about how this works, so the actual OpenCL is happening on the back end server. And if this were on Amazon, OpenCL would only be happening on that server. What you have on your client is just um, basically well, updated positions of where the particle should be at, a, at points, points in time. But the position and everything is calculated on server side. So basically, just the WebGL enabled browser, Google, Firefox, Safari will enable it, will do. And that's all we need. Great. Great. Cool, right? So, don't you guys think though that for both these, that that the multi-user mode? I mean, so right now everybody should get the same thing is kind of the model. But eventually, won't the shouldn't the mode be that like um, new users should be able to get their own separate sessions, which basically sort of clones the the algorithm on the back end in some way and yeah, well, things. that that kind of um, that's a lot harder. It's, it's challenge in terms of hardware requirements because. Uh, I mean, you could queue everything up to the same uh, if you're using the GPU, GPU, but it's a whole new level of complexity in the sense that you have to package requests from different clients to the same um, request for the GPU. So I'm packaging data from Steve and data from Mike, data from Tim, and then I'm sending everything together down to the GPU, and then when it comes back, I'm looking at the IDs and splitting it up because we have one device. If we had like a grid or an infinite number of devices, then it will be okay. Or if we bring up a new instance when someone starts a simulation, then maybe it will that. Be okay. Maybe that. I mean that would be the that would be the simplest way to do it. Yeah. So it's definitely it will be definitely like one hundred times nicer. And you have the um, option to connect to the simulation or that another guy is running or to run your own. It will be nicer. But you can see that there's a whole lot of uh, issues yeah, that come with it. I, I think that uh, Steve and I, uh, I think I kind of want to do that. Uh, uh, remember, we were discussing in Munich last time. Uh, because there is uh, actually one of the, I, I don't think we'll be leveraging probably the GPU 
as much as possible in the sense that you still get the bottleneck of putting things in and getting them out. So what I was thinking is that we could actually get the GPU to run in parallel different simulation, my simulation, my simulation, your simulation, if we are connected at the same time. But basically, the, ideally, the, 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 mm, uh, let, let me stop this. Ideally, what I, where I would like to get is a way that uh, every simulation has an ID. So you go to Open World, and then you say, OK, look, there are these, if they are public, OK? And we are adding complexity, but ideally. So you see all the IDs of the different simulations that are ongoing if they are public, or you can start your own simulation, you can make it private or public, and if you join, basically, if you are an observer of another simulation that is already there, you just click on it and you see what is happening. Then you might be seeing what Mike is doing with its own simulation while in Cambridge, and you are in San Diego. I would like to get there. Obviously, we'll... Uh, will hit a point where, for instance, we realize that it won't basically that it gets too slow when there are more than two simulations ongoing in the same server. But as you say, we could think of, an, uh, of spreading even more the architecture in the sense that uh, we use different servers to run the same simulation. Or, But I, I am almost never interested in sort of computational roadblocks in the sense that even just to develop this thing, it will take uh, another year, another two years, and by then, all these problems might not even be there. I, but I would definitely like for people to be able to create new simulation and do what we say. Yeah, I, I think that the technical challenges are such that you should try and keep that, that aspect of things as simple as possible right now. Get the well, yeah, that, that that's, what, <laughs> that's what we're trying to do, yes. Yeah. Just to figure out, uh, it's hard. Even even at this level, it's it's quite hard. Um, so we need to do it step by step. We know that w what we would like, but it's gonna take time. Yeah, well, it is very cool, guys. Definitely, it's really impressive. Do you have a Do you have a visualization of SPH that you're running on yours? There? Yes, of course. Hang on. Um, awesome. Let me let me do it now. It's. Uh, Screen share. Ta -da. It's a. <laughs> it's just a. It's just a squidgy worm-like object. Yes. And I haven't. I, I know very little about how it works or anything because I've literally got it to work. You know, five minutes before the hangout started, but it looks. It looks right. This, this 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 liquid, which is or fluid, which is at the bottom, and then it's a uh, yeah. It's just what we see on YouTube. So and now you now I want to pardon. Can you start? I mean, it's not laying on the. Fluid, no, it started. It started. It's just the simulation. So, oh, it's, it's, just said, not, it, it's just static. It's running. Okay. Okay, okay. No, it's so just, there's just another configuration where, because I remember there was a video where the world was kind of splashing. Yeah, yeah, that's not the one I have. So oh. I really, I really, I really have no experience in using it because I've literally just got it to work. Okay. But the reason, it's the simulation is running, and if you're here, you'd be able to see that the, the little water, the little water particles are actually moving randomly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, anyway. Now I need to understand how you can stop stop the simulation loop, pass it information, and then start it again. Yeah. Okay. I'll Good try progress. And ask, I'll try and ask uh, Andre for some more some more dem demos. So it's not it's not that uh, crazy to look at, but it's, it, believe me, after 16 hours of trying to get it to work, <laughs> I was very I was very happy when that came up on my screen. Yeah. I know and, exactly what you're talking about. And uh, the, the the thing is, like I, I had got to the point where I just did not expect it to work. So I more just hit the compile button as like out of desperation, and suddenly it was there. I was like, oh my god. Uh, which was the <laughs> just quick, briefly? Which was the main file that needs to be compiled? Do you remember? The um, it's graphics.h. 
graphics that H. Sorry, gra I mean graphics that graphics that CPP okay. is the main. Yeah. Um, okay. And to be clear, right? There's a bunch of branches under this project, right? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Project, are you are you looking at the Linux version right now? Are you trying to compile the Linux? I'm trying to compile the Linux version. Yeah. Okay, so you need to. There's a, a branch and it's called integrated something or other. That's what you need to check out. Okay. And, and once you check that, once, once you check that out, then yeah, you need to uh, compile. You need to compile graphics.cpp and ev it is basically everything in the source folder. Um, yeah. And you need the following libraries, which I'll t tell you in one in one. Yeah, I mean, if if you can get a, a script even. Uh, the Shell, the shell file um, that will, whatever you're using to compile that, so that I can attempt to install various libraries. I'm using I'm using Eclipse. Oh, okay. So okay. because that's but um, then there you need these libraries. Yeah, I mean even even committing the um, uh, Eclipse project files. Yeah, why don't be... we put the Eclipse project on the? Okay, because I know very little about Eclipse, so I didn't know there were I mean, Eclipse project files existed. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we want to, because we now we have all these branches. Maybe we want to start consolidating some of them. Um, yeah, I, but apparently the integrated one is just the last one. It just mm. should probably go back to master, overwrite everything, and that's it, and close everything else. I mean, it might be. Yeah, I, have a different, I don't, I don't, I don't know, know that it's the last one. Yeah. As in, well, I have the, the feeling that uh, I have the feeling that Andre will keep working on his version. And this is the version that Mike will use to integrate. That's why it's called integrate. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, just my feeling. No, I think uh, it's called integrate because Sergey integrated all the features they added so far in the dark branch. Okay. That I get cool. the I get the impression that Andre and Sergey are quite on top of things with that regard. So I would just let them, you know. Ah yes, carry on sure. Bring, carry on. Sure. But at some stage, there's gonna have to be a, a main line, as in. The master branch. Mm -hmm. At the moment, uh, there's a thousand uh, branches, and we don't know which one is the latest, unless someone tells us. So what Matteo is saying is, be nice if the latest was the master. Yeah. Uh, Andre and Sergey aren't aren't um, very hot on documentation, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's okay as long as we can send them an email. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think the last person we haven't heard any we haven't heard independently from is Korg. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, I did see some commits from you in the last couple of weeks, so you've been doing something. Sorry. I, sorry. I've seen some commits on GitHub in the last in the last couple of weeks. Uh, yes, very. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that was for testing the open worm in uh, NewML two. With uh, some of Mike's libraries for LibNewML uh, and seeing how, because I think in the longer run, uh, as opposed to generating the connections in NeuroConstruct, I think the better solution would be to pull out as much information from the uh, spreadsheet as possible. If there's extra information in the spreadsheet about connections, use that. But if not, uh, generate just some simple algorithm written in um, uh, LibNeuroML to calculate closest distances on between points on neurons um, and fill out the NeuroML uh, version that way because there are there is a lot of specific things to um, OpenWorm that may or may not be implemented in NeuroConstruct. But if information is missing from the spreadsheet, the easiest thing is just to get the closest points, at random points. And if there's a if there's a nice visualization on top of that, then um, we can use the visualization to update those points later, maybe put those back in the spreadsheet, um, and that ha have that as a source of where all these connections are coming from. So I've committed a little bit of that on the Seal Against NeuroML project, um, but it's still ongoing work. But uh, if, there, if there is some movement on the spreadsheet, then that would be great, um, and I can have a look at it again. Uh, what, what I do think, actually, in the long run, whatever about um, integrating CapMate and NeuroML, I think from the point of view of people just looking at neurons, identifying synapses, 
it, it might be a nice medium, short, medium term solution for somebody just to actually look at the neuron in the uh, Neuromel browser or in Neuroconstruct, identify which segment on the axon of an identified neuron they think the connection is at. Even looking at the Emmons Lab database, uh, seeing that it's halfway along the axon, locating a Neuroconstruct where, what point that, what segment that is, and then adding that to the spreadsheet um, would make it perfectly possible to pull all that information out of the spreadsheet and put that into Neuromel. And then there's no question about integrating or pulling the information out of the Emmons Lab database in an appropriate format, converting between 3D atlases. You just look at it in Neuro, Neuro, Neuroconstruct, look where the synapse is supposed to be at, and then convert that to the appropriate point, put that in the spreadsheet in some format, and then it's in perfectly valid Neuromel. And I think that can be done for CatMade as well, because it'll be almost impossible if you trace a neuron in CatMade. It's in a slightly different formation. It's not wiggling like the Neuromel worm is, uh, but you know that it's halfway along or two-thirds of the way along some branch of a, an axon. If you can just look at where it should be in Neuroconstruct, mm -hmm. locate that segment, put the name of that segment into the um, uh, the Excel spreadsheet, put your name beside it, then that's a lot more valuable than, and perfectly useful in Neuromel than anything else. Yep, yep. Um. Have you heard anything from the from like Stefan Gerhardt or the CatMade folks that, in terms of increasing their uh -huh. No, I mean I think I mean we've been discussing it here as well about um, whether the you would need to have okay it's the way connections are specified at the moment in Neuromel one it's more you specify your cells and then afterwards you specify there's a connection between segment A and segment B. So version two is going to have to move more towards allowing the option of specifying a cell plus synapses, and then at a later point saying there's a connection between synapse A on cell one and synapse B on cell two. So it's a slightly different um, way of specifying it, which would make it a lot easier to export, and that's the kind of more natural way for exporting something from CapMade. But if we just have a spreadsheet saying the connections between ADAL and ADAR are at this location or relative to the neuromel um, morphology, then we can pull that out of the spreadsheet in whatever format we want. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, anything else? Not, not. I did try the Linux um, uh, compilation of SPH, but um, didn't get too far. But now that Mike's done it, makes it a whole lot more easier. There you go. So they're spreading the knowledge around. Yeah. Excellent. What, what did I do? You uh, successfully built uh, Linux SPH before for a guest. You've, been, so you've encouraged him. You've created hope. If uh, Have you been having trouble, Podrick? I tried very briefly, and uh, it was clear that the Intel uh, SPK wasn't sufficient, so I stopped at that point. Yeah, uh, OK. I've, now that I've done it, if you if you want to try again, I could I I, I could probably help you. Okay. Because there's a lot of things that I've tried, which you'll probably try as well. Yeah, I mean I'll I'll install I've installed the um, Intel SDK. I'll install the Nvidia one as well, and um, see where it goes from there. All right, everybody. Um, almost at the top of the hour, and I, I have a hard stop here at the top. So I think this is a very, very productive last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of good stuff, and we took us all the way to the end of the here. Um, this is a heads up. So uh, this is our first meeting in November, and next one will be the last meeting in November, but it's also our last meeting of the release. So I um, don't have time to go back through the epics right now, but I will be doing a recap on all those things that we intended to do and how we and how far we got. Actually, it, we're kind of coming in at the last minute um, to kind of like succeeding on a lot of these things. It uh, seemed like perhaps they might not have come together, um, but uh, it's been pretty awesome. So I'll try to get that out sooner rather than later so that we can use that as our guide to check things off here. And then um, starting next week, or starting next uh, meeting, uh, in two weeks, uh, we'll be back on the Wednesday. 
than it usually is. Um, we'll start in earnest, actually uh, focusing less on our progress um, and more on our future um, and uh, where we want to take this. So um, be thinking about um, something in the scope of six months. It seems uh, you know, ambitious, but um, whether we can get done. Again, um, you know, everyone who's, who attends these, it's, it's all about you guys taking ownership over the pieces of this. So it's really, it's not, it's not me figuring out what to do. It's me figuring out how to coordinate so you figure out how to do it um, so that it, it, it all adds up. Um, so uh, bring your thing caps on for next time. Looking forward to that. And um, I don't know. I just, awesome stuff, guys. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what this goes. All right. All right. Thanks so much. See you guys in two weeks. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye.